Pedro Lucazzo, and today I will just talk about a short review on brain-inspired computing with memory stiff crossbars. So the outline of this presentation will be a very brief, brief introduction to neuromorphic computing, why it is necessary. And then I will just define what is a memory store, as Francesco was doing in the previous presentation. And I will consider one of the different configurations that you uh, may find in the literature, which is called the memory store crossbars. And I will talk about the application in which you can consider these crossbars. So for example, linear algebra, feed forward neural networks, or recurrent neural network. At the end, I will just show some limitations and briefly conclude uh, this presentation. So as Francesca was highlighting in the previous presentation, um, the, the, some, some would say that the future of electronics is based on memory stiff systems. We know that now the data is growing faster and faster than Moore's law. And so the current memory technologies are kind of a limiting factor. So we would like to have better mem memory storage, bio-inspired computing, and of course, in-memory computing. So the idea of neuromorphic computing, try to emulate the neural structure and operation of the brain in order to create low power computing platform platforms that can be used for different application. For example, AI application. So as Francesca was really uh, carefully introducing in the previous pr presentation, uh, a memory store is just a, um, a device that was theoretically uh, proposed by Professor Leon Chua in 1971, and then um, realized in 2008 by HB and Professor Williams. In terms of voltage current characteristic, it's just a two terminal memory store, and it is described by these mem conductance or simply conductance, which may depend on a set of first and second order state variables, as you saw in the previous uh, presentation, which are linked to internal geometric parameters or, for example, temperature. So these are the two uh, most cited articles that you can find in literature. So the first one is the one coming from Professor Chua and the second one coming from Professor Williams. So the idea today is to introduce you to one of the different architecture that are currently used in, uh, in, in this new area, um, which are called memory store crossbars. Um, these are, um, th there is a kind of, the idea is to try to connect uh, these, these new uh, type of network with the biological, bio-inspired approaches. So as you can see here on the right, we have our crossbar in which there are two electrodes, the top electrode, which can consider as the uh, axon that is um, propagating a presynaptic signal. And then at, on the bottom electrode, there will be a postsynaptic signal that can compute what is the, uh, for example, uh, matrix vector multiplication of the input signal and a conductance, which is defined as the synapse of our uh, neuron. So the synapse in our case will be a switching layer, can be defined as a switching layer. And here we can consider all the previously uh, defined um, devices like PCM or multi-filamentary multi uh, materials that can that has these uh, memory stiff uh, properties. So a first crossbar was actually um, proposed in 1961 by Steinbuch uh, by considering resistive elements. And he was trying to parallelize matrix vector multiplication using physical laws such as Kirchhoff's law and Ohm's law. Of course, at the time, digital was um, well, it, it, would, it was actually not so much um, appealing, and so digital then became much more famous. But now that we have memory store that can be seen as tunable analog resistors, of course, crossbars are coming again to be important uh, architecture to analyze. So as you can see here on the top left, uh, we have um, an, an input vector with, that we introduce to the crossbar. and at the, uh, for each column, we will just collect what is the current that is flowing outside, which will, which define, which will define the multiplication by uh, the row of the matrix, the transpose of the matrix uh, with the input vector. Of course, then you can also um, change the, uh, uh, convert the 
current into voltage and then maybe consider it for um, an iterative process. So if we want to perform a matrix vector multiplication, for example, uh, we need to uh, map our matrix inside the, con the crossbar. So each conductance should be the same value that we want in our, that we should have in, a, um, in order to perform the multiplication. So we want different conductance levels. And here on the top left, we have um, IV cures uh, showed by an article from Professor Williams, uh, which is called an analog signal and images processing by using large memory store crossbars in which they were showing that there is a good IV linearity. And this is uh, a good property that we want in our device in order to program them and not to uh, find um, appropriate like uh, oscillating um, or, or non-leader um, phenomena in our memory store in the meanwhile we are programming them. As Francesca was pointing out and also in, in one of the, the questions, uh, one of the first uh, variation that we can have is exactly in the programming phase. When we want to, for example, a conductance of 10, uh, I would just use like random numbers. Uh, we, we have to set uh, an interval in which we say, okay, from 9.9 .9 to 10.1, all the values which are lying inside are fine for me as equal to 10. And if you plot the histogram of the cycle to cycle programming variations, then you can see here that this is really, uh, this can be really fitted by a normal distribution. Another thing to consider is, okay, what is the conductance range that we have in our devices? And how can we handle negative values? Because when we have matrix vector multiplication or neural networks, we have to consider also uh, to, to have negative values. So the first thing to say is, okay, uh, I know that my, my technology will handle uh, a particular conductance range, which is defined as G off, G on. And we consider a matrix A that we want to map inside the crossbar. So the first thing that you have to do is a linear transformation. You take your matrix and you map, into, and you map it into, into the crossbar by using a scaling procedure and a translation of, our, of, the, of the matrix. In, in, uh, by doing this linear transformation, all the values that you will have are inside the conductance range and you can easily, pro easily of course, you can program them inside your crossbar. Well, at the end of your operation, you have to perform a recovering step just to obtain the correct results that you want it in the, um, in the, in the considered, range, considered range that you had in your, in your matrix. You also uh, can consider differential pairs of a mister to form, for example, synaptic weight for a neural network. You, with this structure, you can al allow to have both signs, so minus and plus with conductance for, for conductances. And also you can play with the magnitude of each conductance. So if you want to have some value which are outside the conductance range, you can play with two conductances of the memory stores, of the two memory stores. So the first application I would like to talk to you is actually one, the one that we are currently working on is application in linear algebra. Professor Yelmini proposed these um, new article in which he was trying to uh, uh, talk about different application that might uh, come out in, in, uh, in some of the computation. Matrix vector multiplication, of course, is the first one, as we were saying before. And then he also considered linear systems and, and how to compute the dominant eigenvector of, um, of a matrix. The last two systems, of course, are working just in some cases and we are actually analyzing was what are the cases in which you can perform this uh, type of linear algebra computation. Uh, but the important thing is that all these three uh, computations are has a time have a time complexity which depend of the size of the problem. But uh, Professor Yermini showed that by using a crossbar uh, the you can handle your computation in just one time step. A second application that I would like to talk to you is the feed forward neural network. Here, of course, is a, one of the most simple case, but we, the simplest case, but we have a shallow neural network in which we consider one hidden layer. 
And we want to map the first matrix of the weight matrix, which are connected input and hidden layers, and then a second matrix in which we have uh, hidden and output neuron co um, connected. As you can see here, we consider a differential pair in order to allow to have also negative values. Uh, in this article, but there are also other articles which are trying to deal with the nonlinearity functions. In this article, uh, the nonlinear function that you have inside uh, between the two layers uh, was partly software. The result that they showed in this application was okay, let's start from one of the most famous uh, classification tasks. So we take the we consider the MNIST data set, and we unwrap the image and introduce to the uh, to our conductance matrix. And uh, what we get after collecting all the, the values which are coming, which are uh, flowing down by um, by the crossbar is actually the the class of the of the image that we you want to classify. Um, authors claim that they had. Um, an inference output of 99% accuracy on the training set, but 97% accuracy on test set, which is actually something that you can also have in uh, by, uh, that you can also have in a software application. Uh, the important thing is uh, here in the conductance range, they were claiming that some of the devices were not properly programmed or they were not working very well. But these 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 this did not uh, influence the, um, the accuracy of, of, of what they found. So a third problem uh, that, a third application, sorry, that we can consider is the application to energy-based models. One of the most famous is the Hopfin neural network, then we have also cellular nonlinear, cellular nonlinear network. Um, here comes the idea of, okay, we know that we have many noise, uh, inside our crossbars. And in the previous, of course, in the previous um, application, the noise is better to uh, maybe to reduce the, the, his magnitude, its magnitude. But in this case, noise can be considered to build optimizer solver that use the noise in order to find better local minima. It's very well known that Hopfin your network are able to solve traveling salesman, pattern reconstruction, max cat problems, so combinatorial, combinatorial problems, but of course they um, have a big problem or stacking in, into um, local minima. So the noise that is coming from the crossbar can be actually useful here in order to find a global minima of our system. So I will briefly uh, conclude so with some limitation and I mean pros and cons. So memory store based brain inspired computing is at first stages of life. Uh, of course, this can uh, this is uh, this is a new area of uh, research, but this gives us many opportunities and challenges to consider many different applications and many different, uh, for example, learning room for um, applying them into our neural networks. When you have heavy computation, such as in linear algebra and neural networks, like linear computation, of course, the crossbar can help us to uh, improve our uh, efficiency. Uh, there are many research studies, as also Francesca was highlighting, that are still trying to exploit the underlying device physics to emulate brain-inspired computing. Uh, this is actually one of our um, paper talking about a different learning rule which is trying to uh, approximate the back propagation um, update rule which is actually one of the most um, difficult thing to um, to apply when programming your uh, crossbars uh, but of course when you when you just have to deal with the inference if you program your matrices in order to handle the inference process of a neural network then you will have significant improvements in terms of computation time uh, one of the main problem is can be the limiting uh, conductance levels. So if we don't have many conductance levels, then this can affect our precision and also accuracy. And of course, there is still uh, needed further improvements in terms of power dissipation and also scalability issues. So most of the uh, crossbar that we can consider now are 128 times 128 um, crossbars of memory stores, uh, so we, we cannot consider like very large problem, but this is 
something that is kind of um, studied now. So thank you for the attention. And of course, if you have any questions on the uh, implementation architecture, I would like to I, <laughs> I would like to try to help you. Okay, thank you, Gianluca, for the interesting talk. I see three questions at the moment. Okay, the first one is, is any of these applications already implemented and tested experimentally or they are just theoretical? So the one, for example, of NIST classification is already implemented on Secret. And uh, Opfield, and now uh, there is a, a new article in which they are talking about Opfield neural networks that where they are uh, simulating and trying to uh, um, also simulate these on, uh, on the hardware. Okay. Uh, second question is, how long does an array preserve the programmed values in current technologies before needing some form of refreshing? Okay, so um, I don't have a real uh, answer to this. Um, of course, there are many problems of the, uh, for memory. Um, maybe, I don't know if Francesco knows a better answer uh, because he's working on the, <laughs> on the device uh, application. I don't know, Francesco. Francesco, if you want, you can switch on your microphone and uh, so, your camera. So, sorry, sorry, I, I had some problem with my headphones. So can you repeat the question? Because I was a okay. little distracted. It's how long does an array preserve the programmed values in current technologies before needing some form of refreshing? Uh, well, the, there is some resistance drift in current technology. You can measure it. But there are also many clever workarounds. For example, you can search for the projected cells which are being developed uh, at uh, IBM. And th this is, I can speak for my own uh, technology uh, branch. Uh, th these will solve when they are uh, correctly implemented, this will solve the problem of drifting. So you basically have like two cells and one copies the other. The other is like a sample of the drifting of the first one. So you can compensate that phenomenon and you can solve this problem drifting, but it's something that exists and this limits the current applications in networks that need to be reprogrammed um, every, every once in a while. For example, I can give you some number, maybe after a day or 12 hours, the crossbar needs a reprogramming step because the values have drifted for internal phenomena because you have basically ions moving around or you have um, crystal or amorphous phases which relax and lose their original properties. But this is, this is being addressed and we are really close to a solution for certain technologies. Okay. We have other questions. Uh, can those structures be used with within a backpropagation loop as in a traditional neural network? Yes, so the, the, some, some, some research group are trying to um, implement the backpropagation or other different learning rules. Uh, so for example, so for the opt-in neural network, the Hebbian rule, which, is, which can also be iterative. And of course, this, this is one of the most difficult thing to do, like reprogram every time. But uh, there is also a study in which if there is, when you're reprogramming your memory stores, the conductance is not the correct one, which is having some of noise probably uh, by the programming phase. This, this is not really affecting the accuracy of the system, but this is also something studied in the neural network literature. Okay. Now we have a very long question. The membrane technology seems to be very promising for neuromorphic applications in which analog computing is employed to take advantage of the home law to enhance the performance. However, most of data processing nowadays is performed in the digital domain. Do you think that the, the membrane may represent a good alternative to the CMOS technologies for general purpose computing? Uh, I mean, from my side, yes. 
but Francesco. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't think that any time in the next 20, 40 years, CMOS will be replaced in these core domains, which are CPUs and like RAMs and this kind of applications. But there are certain niches, niches like, um, for example, machine learning, where you need to do so much matrix vector, so many matrix vector multiplications that the current von Neumann bottleneck is really limiting the software, the, algor the algorithms could run order of magnitudes faster and more efficiently on this kind of neuromorphic circuits than they do on uh, CPUs and GPUs right now. Okay, and we have the last question. Do you think we will ever see a memory store CPU? <laughs> <laughs> I think Francesco I already think. said this, yeah. <laughs> I don't think. But Boolean logic is uh, really a uh, fundamental of our current technology and it will not be replaced neither by neuromorphic nor by quantum. Th those are solution for problem that uh, reason later and but the classical problems that have always been solved really efficiently by Boolean logic and uh, by digital computers, I think are going to being solved the same way for the foreseeable future. 